What are the fates of two of our apostles? That's what we're going to find out next in Acts 12. Boy, this is going to be an interesting one for sure, because right at the very beginning, we talk about what Herod the king, again, Rome wouldn't have called him a king, but I think Herod called himself a king, laid violent hands on some who belonged in the church. This is going to be Herod Agrippa I. He is the grandson of Herod the Great. So remember, Herod the Great made this great pact with the Romans, he had this sort of settled peace, gave power to the Sanhedrin and the temple structure, built all this and built amazing buildings, some palaces and structures for himself, but also the temple. He made it more grand. Now, this is his grandson, and it said that he put a violent hand against him. Oh, boy. And he kills James, the brother of John. That's going to be the the disciple Jesus loves, with a sword. And he saw that it pleased the Jews, the people around him. So he decided, I'm going to go arrest Peter as well. Like I said, they must have been disappointed, both the Herod structure and the temple structure. Because they thought by killing Jesus, this would be over. And you know what? It is growing by leaps and bounds. And Peter, boy, you know, he's the head of this whole piece. I'm not sure how James got caught up into this. Boy, poor James. We will get to talk to him in heaven. And it said it pleased people. So he arrests Peter with the idea he's going to kill him too. It was the day of unleavened bread. And apart from Judas, that makes James the first of the apostles to die. It's interesting because the last of the apostles to die is going to be John. So James was not killed legally because what we remember, only Romans are allowed to kill people. Herod Agrippa's role was from 41 AD to 44 AD, and he was known to be particularly cruel to the church. So it says that it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which again is going to be the week following Passover. This is going to be the week Jesus was killed, right? Passover is 24 hours about the deliverance from Egypt. And now this is the week after. And just keep in mind, when I say a year later, I don't mean our calendar year. I mean the Jewish calendar year. So keep that in mind. They seized him. They put him in prison. And the idea is that they were going to deliver him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. This guy is not getting away this time. Remember last time he walked out? Not this time. Intending that after Passover, they were going to bring him out and kill him. When you think back too, the whole city, just like when it was in the time of Jesus, was going to be chock full of people coming to the temple for Passover. So waiting until after that time yet again, so that the people would go away and it wouldn't be such a hubbub. And in some of the commentary notes, it said that usually a soldier had a three-hour watch. So four squads would be the number in a 12-hour period. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Our church is standing together and praying for Peter. They must be beside themselves that now they're going to lose Peter too, just like they lost Jesus. A miracle happens. Herod was about to bring him out. And on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound in chains. Like, you are not getting away this time. We're not letting any of this mess up. There were also sentries at the door. People feel that because it was the Sanhedrin that arrested Peter. This is going to be in the temple prison, not the Roman one that was built in Antonia Tower in the northwest corner of the temple area. That is where we would have kept Roman prisoners. Uh, But either way, security was tight. And then an angel of the Lord stood up next to him. The light shone in his cell, and it says he struck Peter on the side, woke him up quickly, and the chains fell from his hand. That's funny. Peter's a good sleeper. He's sleeping in prison and chained up to people. I don't know if I'd be sleeping if the next day I'd be put to death. But you know what? Maybe it's that God faith. Whatever happens tomorrow, that happens. I'm going to sleep. So Angel wakes him up. He wrapped his cloak around him, put on his sandals, walked out and followed the angel. He said he didn't know if what was happening with this angel was real. Or, you know, maybe he was seeing a vision. He just got done with this vision of the giant sheet and the animals on it. And so he's like, well, I've been seeing visions lately. Maybe this is just more of them. But instead, this turned out to be real. 
So the angel passed the first guard. The second guard that came out of the iron gate opened, it said, on its own accord. And they went out and walked around the street. And then the angel left him. It says, quote, Peter came to himself. He realized he was awake and he was fully awake. And now he was certain that the angel was sent by the Lord to rescue him from the hands of Herod and from all the Jewish people who were expecting to see him put to death. It says that when he came to this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. This is John Mark. This is going to be the writer of Mark, <laughs> right? And it said the people were there gathered together and praying. He knocked at the door. <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible because it kind of cracks me up. And one thing to say, you know, it's interesting because there were some r rumors or, or church tradition that when they went to the upper room with Jesus in Passover, this upper room was owned by the parents of John Mark. And John Mark was the young man who carried the water where Jesus says, go find the man carrying water and say that you need a room and he'll take you up to this upper room and that's where we're going to have Passover. So I wonder if all those places that they were at was the same upper room that they were waiting at during Passover meal. And we will certainly hear about John Mark, about what happens with him and his mother and how it was known that they opened their house up to the church. So a servant girl named Rhoda answered the door. She recognized Peter's voice. And in her joy, she didn't open up the gate, but ran and reported, hey, you know what? Peter is at the door. <laughs> You, 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 left, you left him outside, a wanted man. You just kind of left him there. I'm sure Peter's like, uh, hello? H hello? And so there I just have this image of poor Peter standing there at the gate. So they said to her, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but she kept insisting it was so. And then they said, you know what? It is his angel. And so people feel that that means guardian angel. That is his guardian angel who went and saved him. Even Jewish people at that time believed in personal guardian angels who could make themselves visible or invisible, look like a different person. So it's not unheard of to Jewish people either. So Peter kept knocking. Hello? Any, anyone there? And so they opened it up and they saw him and everyone was amazed. They brought him in. They told him to be silent. And he described to them how he was brought out of prison, you know, what happened. Then Peter said, Tell James and the brothers. In this case, this is going to be James, who was Jesus' brother. Again, this is a difference between Protestants and Catholics. Uh, Catholics, I think, would say this is his brother in spirit, a part of the disciples, but not his brother brother. While I'm a Protestant, and so we believe this is his brother brother. This James is going to become the head of the Church of Jerusalem at some point. So this is a guy, at the time of Jesus' life, you know, they came to his door and said, you know, clearly he's out of his mind. Jesus has gone too far. Now, this guy's a believer. And not the joke, but the, the interesting thing that a lot of pastors like to talk about is when you convince your sibling that you're the Lord, that's hard to do because your siblings have seen it all. And if his sibling is the Lord, he'd be the first to deny it. But instead, now he's a believer. He is part of the church. Everyone thinks that's why he specifically said that. Tell, tell James himself. This guy's going to be the head of the church of Jerusalem. And after Herod, it says, searched for him and did not find him, they talked to the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. I mean, they knew it. They knew that this was coming. And then it says Herod went from Judea to Caesarea. He said Caesarea's on the coast. It's gorgeous. And it was a major port city for traffic and goods and materials and people to go back and forth to Rome from there. So it, it was a good place to go. But I imagine what he was doing was just getting out of this. Oh, this place is going to be a disaster. I need a vacation. I don't know if he said I needed a vacation, but he was basically looking to get out of there. It says that now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. That's going to be people to the north, what we would consider to be part of Syria today, because it says that they came to him in one accord. They asked for peace because their country needed food, remember, in a famine from the king. And on the appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes. He sat on his throne. 
gave him a speech, and the people were shouting about the voice of God and not the voice of a man. An angel struck him down, struck down Herod, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. That's Herod, and that is the end of Herod's grandson. Herod himself went down in death in a pretty horrible way, and now the grandson is as well. And then it says that the word of God increased and was multiplied. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, and they had completed their service, and bringing with them John, whose name was Mark, right? So John Mark comes with him. And maybe by Barnabas taking Saul back to Antioch, but bringing John Mark, isn't that discipleship? We take a young follower and show him the way, show him what we're doing. We're teaching the next generation of messengers, of disciples. Boy, that Barnabas. That ends Acts 12. I think what I'm going to meditate on this week is the fact that we have two apostles. One was put to death and the other was saved. And sometimes in church history or sometimes pastors or sometimes ourselves will say something like, well, you know, if you had this hardship, it's probably God punishing you. You're going to have to think about what you did, you know. And that's not true. We have two apostles, James, who was one of the first, and Peter, who was one of the first. Two amazing apostles. One was killed by the sword and brought home to Jesus in heaven, and the other was spared, left here on earth to commit to do more of his ministry. Why do these things happen? I mean, we could go on all day. Why, why does it happen when a good family in our church was killed? I, I don't know. Peter's job wasn't done. He had more work to do, and God kept him here. What I'm going to meditate on is we cannot ever think what is happening in someone's life is an indication of what God thinks of them. God knows the whole plan. He sees it from, let's just say, the ultimate mountaintop. He knows how this is playing out. We'll get a chance to talk to both James and Peter about this someday. What I'm going to pray about is this idea of expecting miracles. <laughs> you know, the church prayed for Peter. I'm sure this girl, Rhoda, knew the church was praying for him. And when she heard his voice, she knew this was a deliverance from God. People didn't believe it right away. Are you praying to God and you don't really believe what you say is going to happen or could possibly happen? It's kind of interesting, right? I'm going to pray that I never disbelieve a miracle of God, even when I'm praying for it. That's, that's what I'm going to pray about. And what I'm going to share with others is this idea that we should go into praying for miracles, praying for our brothers and sisters, praying that they are kept from things that are horrible and expect good things to happen. It doesn't happen in every case. We saw that with James, but it does happen. And so we shouldn't be shocked when we actually see those things happen. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please subscribe and tell a friend. And if you're interested in a particular topic that you would like me to cover in Small Steps with God, I'd be happy to. That podcast is talking about topics while we're going through the Bible chapter by chapter. So please let me know. You can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much.